Hey everybody, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about collisions. We're gonna add some collisions to our hero and to our world environment. And then we're also gonna talk about some perspective layering, which is an important concept in any top-down game. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Drew, I teach people how to get into game development. If you're interested in that kind of thing, hit subscribe. Now in our last video, we covered top-down movement, meaning we can move the character around with our arrow keys and stuff. If you missed that, the link is in the description below. Um, but there's a problem here where as soon as I try to move the character over a wall, um, he kind of just barges through it. That's not what we want. We want the wall to stop him from moving any further. That in this kind of game is a concept called collisions. And we'll talk through how to do that in Godot right now. In the Godot editor here, I'm going to say shift command O, and that's going to let us open up a scene. And I'm going to select our hero scene from before. Uh, and I'll go over to our 2D view. Remember, we have the seed character with a shadow. And uh, I'm going to move the shadow so he's kind of sitting on the ground. You may have noticed that Godot is throwing a warning to us, and the warning says, hey, you don't have a collision shape 2D in this scene, or in this node. And this node is a type of kinematic body 2D, which is a perfect choice for a body that moves around and collides with other things. But we need to tell Godot actually how big is this thing, and like what parts of this hero are collidable. So to do that, we will right click, let's add a new node type. I'll search for collision shape 2D, select that. And now we have a collision shape underneath our hero, but again, we have another warning. And this warning says that we haven't applied a shape yet. Something you quickly get used to in Godot is this pattern of creating nodes and then needing to configure important visual parts in the inspector. Uh, just like before, if you remember when we created a sprite, we created the sprite, but it was essentially empty. We had to add in a texture, which is the part we see as kind of the meat of everything. Um, collision shapes are the same way. So you create a collision shape, it starts empty, but over here there's a shape property we can click this drop down here to say for the shape property we want to create a new shape and we'll use capsule shape 2d now you see that this greenish bluish area has appeared over our hero and this is the visualization of the extents of our collision body so we want to adjust the shape to more or less cover the size of the character's body and so there's little handles there's also um, an inspector you can come in here so i'm gonna like rotate it 90 degrees to make it match that shadow a little bit better. What I'll do is just kind of resize it, more or less just try to get it right, the size of the hero. Now our hero is collision ready, but there's nothing else for him to collide into. So let's go into our world map, which is the scene over here, and we'll repeat the same process. One noteworthy difference though is that our world map is of a type node 2D, where our hero is a kinematic body, and you can't just put collision shapes anywhere. Collision shapes go in bodies. So what we'll do is create a different type of body for our, um, our world map. And I've already got it pulled up here, static body 2D. It's a good choice for something that doesn't move. In here, we'll repeat the same process. So right click, add node. Uh, this time we want another collision shape, 2D, create. Same warning from before, because we don't have a shape applied yet. So we'll make sure collision shape selected over here in shape. This time uh, we're making a, a body that's gonna match this wall right here. So we'll use something that's not rounded. How about new rectangle shape 2D? Drag it over on top of our scene, zoom in a little bit, and then use these resize controls. These controls uh, can kind of be a little wonky sometimes, but you can always go into the inspector to fine tune the details to be whatever you want. Now that you can see that the collision shape kind of matches up with the wall. Now when I run the game, and try to move the character through the wall. I can't proceed through the wall because Godot knows that there's two bodies colliding against each other and so they just stop. Something cool to note though, because we use a rounded body for the hero, if he goes up to an edge, see that he kind of rolls off of the edge instead of just stopping? That's kind of a nice friendly touch for not letting the user get stuck on a wall. One side note I want to draw to your attention is that so far with our world map here, we've only been working with one large sprite. The sprite has the wall and the building and the grass and the sidewalk all baked into it. Um, and that's why we applied one collision shape across the entire thing. In Godot, it's also possible to use tile sets where you might be constructing this world out of little individual slices, uh, like stamping whatever you want. That's a really common thing in game development. In that case, you can actually apply collision shapes to individual tiles. So if you have a wall tile, you can add you know, the box shape to it so that anywhere you place the tile, you'll automatically get a collision shape that comes with it. So you don't have to manually be overlaying shapes on top of the worlds you build. That's the kind of thing we might cover in a future video. So this is nice. Our hero can collide with the walls and stuff. That's all working, that's great. But it's a little bit boring. So let's add some more to this scene. 
in our tree over here, I'm going to just right click hero and duplicate it a few times. I'm also going to rename the duplications. Now what that's done is created multiple uh, heroes right on top of where the original one was. So I'll just click and drag to space them out a little bit. Yeah, good. Now we have four different heroes. Now run the game. We have a problem where our movement from our previous video uh, <laughs> applies to all of them, which is kind of strange. So let's fix that. We only want one hero that's uh, controlled by the user. Let's pop open the hero script, which there's four different icons, but they all link to the same script. So we can just click one of them, the hero, and introduce a new concept called is player controlled. And this will be a Boolean. We'll just assume false. Using this flag now, we can come down to the movement logic that we did in the previous video and just nest all of it under that. So if is player controlled, do our colon and then select this whole block here um, and have this only take effect if this particular instance of the hero has this value as true. But now you might be asking, how do we do that? How do we make one player controlled and not? Well, you can do that with code, but you can also do that with the inspector. That's kind of cool. So if I come over here, and then, but right before we declare the variable, I'm going to say the keyword export, export var. And what that's going to do is expose this variable to be editable in the inspector. So I'll pull up our scene again, uh, world map in 2D. And then if I um, select any of these hero instances, you see that now a checkbox uh, that it figures out the name from the variable name, it's now available to us here. And so just on this top hero, I can select this one to be on, which when the code runs, that flag will be true instead of the default false. Now when I run the game, see that only one of the hero instances is actually responding to keyboard control. As I'm running the game here, like we said, only one of them is responding to user input, uh, but they all look the same. So let's do something to make just the player controlled one feel and look a little bit different. Remember how we had the hero levitating before? Let's go ahead and bring that back. But this time we'll do it with code, conditionally only if this particular instance is the player controlled one. So let's go into our hero script. Let's bring back our ready function. And remember ready will fire when this scene enters the parent scene. Uh, and so at that point is player controlled will already be true for the one that we've selected to be true. So we'll just add some logic. If this flag is true, uh, what we can do is grab the hero sprite. If I look at our hero, here's the structure of it. We've got our shadow. Sprite is the actual appearance of the hero, like the seed character, and then our collision shape. Um, I'm going to go into script. And to select just the sprite layer, I can say dollar sign and then the name of the layer. And see, it's already trying to autocomplete for me, but I'll say sprite. And what we can do is adjust the offset of the sprite. So we'll say offset. And the offset's going to have both X and Y on it. We'll say offset Y equals negative six. What that's going to do is just grab the sprite layer itself and raise it six pixels into the air. We'll run the game and see that only the player controlled hero here is elevated into the air. Now we'll see that we've introduced a little bit of a visual problem. If I move the hero closer to a different seed, you see that they get drawn in the wrong order. Like uh, the hero right now is closer to the camera, so it should be appearing on top. Uh, it just looks really funky right now. Luckily in Godot, it's really easy to fix this. As it stands right now, if I go back into our world map scene, uh, Godot will just draw these in the order that they're in the tree, right? So hero is um, on bottom, then person one, person two, person three. And that's why the hero is never appearing above um, anybody that he steps in front. So what we can do is add a new type of node that Godot has uh, pre-built for us. So add child node, and these are called Y sorts. And Y sorts will, um, anything within them, they will draw in correct camera order. So if the, the Y value is higher, meaning it's further down on the screen, that character will appear closer to you. So I'll just uh, grab these layers and move them into our Y sort, run the game, and now our layering problem has been fixed, where no matter what, they'll appear in the correct order. As you can imagine, Y sorts are pretty critical for any top-down kind of game. Alrighty, that's the end of what I wanted to cover in this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a better understanding of collisions and some top-down considerations when you're making games in Godot. 
Again, if you like these kinds of videos, please hit the subscribe button. That really helps me out. And if you're working on a game, maybe you've started a game or want to start a game and you want to tell people about it, be sure to join us in our Discord. We have a growing community of people in there that are making and playing indie games, so definitely come join us. Thanks again, and I'll catch you next time.